What does everybody think so far? Information galore and good, hopefully. It's great to see so many familiar faces here. My name is Kate Wyland Moores, and I am Concurrency's Chief Operating Officer. Um, privileged to work beside Nate Lesnowski, and um, a lot of this information for me, um, I've heard many times, and so happy to share it with all of you today. Um, we're taking this on a road show, so we'll be uh, presenting this Milwaukee, Chicago, Minneapolis, and um, just really great to see the turnout. Um, I'm especially pleased and honored to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Tim Dixon. Tim is the CIO of Generac. I'm sure some of you may have had the pleasure of seeing him speak um, prior to this event today, but he is really the driving, before, driving force behind digital transformation and strategy over at Generac for I think three plus years already, Tim. Um, friend of Concurrency, we've done projects with Generac and I personally have been just so impressed with his level um, of enthusiasm and honestly, just the thirst for innovation and transforming Generac, the manufacturing world, transforming, transforming their business, um, resulting in multiple awards. So you can take a look at some of that information and um, find that yourself on the internet. Just so happy to introduce you, Tim. Thank you for being here today. Right <laughs> no, actually, no. no, I know. I should have done. <laughs> So take it away, guys. All right. Thank Thanks. you. There we go. Morning. Morning. Is anybody here last year for this in the same exact room? I spoke uh, last year as well. If you're here, could have a good dose of Generac a year ago as well. Oh, yeah. And you okay. <laughs> Brand new audience. Nobody knows my jokes. Though. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> well, why don't you, uh, Tim? Uh, Thank you for joining us. Uh, I would love it if you could just even just start by like, hey, like, who are you? Sure. Like, how did you get where you are? What, what's been like your guiding principles for, for Generac? And just like, let's start there. Let's sure. Start from like square one. Yeah. So, um, uh, born and raised in Wisconsin. Who's ever been to La Crosse, Wisconsin? Uh, my hometown. Beautiful town. Yeah, that's a country as they call it. And big news, La Crosse is going to start brewing old style again. Right? They stopped yeah. for a beer town. Beer town. Um, moved away in high school 30 years ago, um, came back uh, for this job at Generac 3, so was, was away and worked in a lot of different places with a lot of different uh, cities, uh, HP, IBM, Dell, Motorola, Laureate, and then Generac, a few startups between uh, Philly, Raleigh, San Francisco, Austin, Chicago, DC, and then here <laughs> to Milwaukee. So I don't uh, you know, advocate that much moving, and certainly my kids wouldn't advocate that either, but uh, I've learned a lot and worked in a lot of different companies and industries. And I'd like to say that Generac was kind of looking for someone who's kind of been there and done that before uh, three years ago when they sort of embarked on their digital transformation. That's just a perfect fit for me. Uh, knowing what I know, doing what I do, the personality that I have, being you know, from the state of Wisconsin, it kind of just became a great fit to come back to Wisconsin lead uh, Generac and their and their digital transformation. And uh, I tell this funny story. If you've ever been to the Milwaukee General Mitchell Airport, you come off the southwest gate there used to be two signs next to each other one sign was uh generac our business is power and that is very much the case we're still very much driven by power outages and things of that nature and our, our products are on backup power generation and help people you know, be resilient and give them peace of mind at times power outages and then the sign right next to it said uh, milwaukee welcome to milwaukee the midwest's coolest most underrated city <laughs> So I thought three years ago when I came back to Milwaukee, if I could help lead digital, uh, Generac in their digital transformation, and at the same time give back to the city of Milwaukee through community service, hopefully improving its tech profile, that would just be an awesome you know, dream come true for me. So that's why I do what I do, and that's why I'm here. Um, you know, Generac has been a uh, an interesting place over the last three years. I would say it was a lot like other um, you know 60 plus year old manufacturing companies here in the area. Um, it was ripe for change. They just didn't have a leader who knew what they were doing and was willing to take some risk. It was very risk averse. It was very on-prem, very back office, and uh, you know, just a, a great playground for me to do what I love to do and take some shots and see, uh, see if we can make a go of it. And I would say the biggest thing that uh, I brought to the team 
for sort of those opportunities. What are the what are the events? What are the opportunities? What are the circumstances? What are the things that we can do together that we could try out and just see if it works? And that out not only gave you know, vendor partners like uh, Concurrency and Nate here an opportunity to partner with us, it gave an opportunity for my team to learn these new tools, learn these skills, try things out and move in their careers, sort of change their career trip like they never would have had before. And so I'm thankful for that as well. And when I look back at my three years at Generac, we've probably had seven or eight hackathons. We've probably had 30 or 40 lunch and learns with various different uh, vendor partners. We've won a few awards along the way. I like to think that uh, we've probably moved, I don't know, 15, 20 people into new roles that didn't even exist in the company. Before I you know, you know, data scientists and things of that nature, um, a number of promotions, a lot of recognition, a seat at the table, the senior leadership team. And so I like to think Generac is in a very good space now, three years later, and we're sort of ready for sort of the next level of transformation. All that stuff that uh, Nate talked about here earlier, we're trying out. So I'd say phase one of the transformation is complete. We think we'll do some wonderful things that have has really moved the company forward. Now we're ready for the next challenge. Here we are. <laughs> So talk a little bit about what you think the state of the state is. You're you're connected with a lot of other leaders in the IT space. Yeah. You know, some are some are moving, some are not. You know, mm -hmm. what's been what's been your experience with like what the state of the state is, what's caught like what what's what's unique about companies that are engaging in AI? Sure. So um, you know, I look I'm pretty opportunistic. I look for, you know, those moments of confusion and chaos and things of that nature. I'm a big proponent of changing the brand perception of IT in the eyes of our business partners and customers, any chance that I get in these moments of confusion and chaos are those opportunities where IT, IT can step up and show up uh, like, like nobody's business. And so that was the situation with ChatGPT. There were other situations uh, prior to that, but I'll use ChatGPT, who came back from the holidays and wondered what the heck ChatGPT was. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, boom, all of a sudden you get hit with this thing and what is it and so on and so forth. And like those are the opportunities that I look at to seize and sort of use those opportunities to transform the business and have IT lead those opportunities. So we were the ones at Generac that basically, you know, put our arms around it, dug deep, played with it, um, you know, put some security. <laughs> around it got security involved and i say in it there's a world of you know, doing things that are accepting to scare and chat gbt very could have very well could have been scary for a lot of people but we were kind of in the accepting well, what, what were those things that we could use the tool for that would be accepting in the general culture that would be accepting from a business standpoint that would be accepting that people could kind of rally around this uh, this new capability discover the possibilities um, and so I speak at a lot of conferences, and uh, I remember back in Aprilish, March, April timeframe, I asked all the CIOs in the audience from Wisconsin CIO. I said, "Who has blocked ChatGPT?" And more than half the people in the audience had blocked ChatGPT, and I couldn't believe. It. And I'm, I'm sitting there, and I was stunned because at that moment, you just halted any chance of innovation, any chance of collaboration any chance of the art of the possible, any chance of IT stepping up and showing up, just complete the opposite of what I'm all about. And I just couldn't believe it. I don't know how many of have turned out since, probably not many, but how could you do that to you, to you, you know, to your teams, uh, to your company? Because what's happened with us, and this is a little plug for concurrency, we had a concurrency out of Generac back in March, April timeframe. We did a an art of the possible sort of hackathon with you guys around Bringing, bringing in sort of subject matter experts around chat GPT, Nate and team, showing us what folks were doing with chat GPT. We had an ideation session. We came up with over 350 use cases for chat GPT, both internal use cases and external use cases. We had some we had a good lunch, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and we played around. We had a lot of post-its and it was just kind of a fun event. We were energized and charged to go do something with this thing. I think they mentioned that we've already launched three of those ideas in production. Uh, one one with uh, the concurrency just here uh, this past Monday, and I look at everything that we've done to sort of sort of inject the company with this new possibility, this new energy, you know, this new era of of AI to generate. And if you had blocked it back then, you would have cut all of that off. And I just couldn't just couldn't understand. Now, is it perfect? No. Are we still learning? Yes. Um, 
and, and one of the uh, we'll talk about some of these use cases, but one of the things that I say and this is going to be one of the uh, reasons why folks come off. So I happen to have an awesome CISO, but I also ha happen to have an awesome digital transformation leader named Dave Mansky. And that is a healthy tension to have in your team. You have a guy pushing the edge, taking risks, wanting to do you know the next best uh, awesome thing, and then you have the other guy who's uh, my cybersecurity guy saying, you know, wait, let's talk about this. You, know, you got to put some policy around this, got to secure it first, and so on and so forth. But that is a healthy tension to have. I'm, I'm very thankful that I have both of those folks in my organization because uh, one it makes me look good, and two, I know that there's always going to be that challenge and that tension. I think that is healthy, and, and maybe other CIOs don't have that. In their organization, and maybe they just want to get the worst care. I don't know, but uh, we got smart about it really quick. We we actually created a uh, chat GPT policy, a security policy. Uh, we I remember this uh, like it was yesterday. We posted the policy on our corporate intranet site. Those are Microsoft guys. That's Microsoft SharePoint Online. Um, we posted this uh, this policy on the um, intranet site, and it basically said, um, "Here's what here's what you need to know about chat GPT." We don't want you putting our company data in it. Uh, we're not going to block it. We're going to create a, a, a separate version internally that uh, you can play around with and we can actually learn about what people want to do with it. And if you have any ideas for how this technology can improve the business, go to David Mansky, you know, one central place in the company to bring your ideas and go nuts. And that policy was awesome because it said the company was willing to take some risk, again, not risk aversion, uh, willing to take some risk, try this thing out, but also encourage people to play around with it. And uh, I think a month or two later, we launched our internal version of ChatGPT 3.5. We call it PowerChat. And I think we had 5,000 users the first week on it, thousands of page views. And, and now we have analytics running on it where we're actually seeing what people are doing with the tool. And they're putting in code, they're using it for testing, they're using it for job description, they're using it for all these wonderful things. Once again, that is all possible because we didn't lock it in the first place. So I'm very proud of the team for what we've done. Like I said, very, very, very early days. When you look at these 350 use cases, but we launched three. So uh, we have a long, long way to go. And uh, we have a monthly update with my boss, the, the CEO, gave him uh, an update on AI last, uh, last Monday. And pretty much we've been sticking to the internal use cases around of chat GPT and open AI, but he wants to go nuts. He wants to go external. He wants to you know, put the stuff external facing. He wants customers coming to the site. You saw some of the stuff that Nate was showing around, you know, predictive maintenance and, and uh, questions about generators and so on and so forth. He wants to go nuts. He wants to put this on the outside. He wants to have a great customer experience. So that's where we're eventually going. Uh, we're not there now, but if you have the CEO now pushing on you to make that happen, it's going to happen. Uh, so it's fun. It's a fun time to be a generator. What's been the process of shepherding those ideas from idea? Yeah. I don't, you know David was very much in the weeds of that. Like <laughs> shepherding. I think some of those are his too. So yeah. uh, self self fulfilling prophecy. So it's big. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> shepherding them from like idea to actual, and from like a sponsorship standpoint, yeah. like the business getting on. And I see. I feel like that's one of the biggest things that you need to be successful. And I think that's actually one of the reasons that Hackathon was so successful mm -hmm. is. It wasn't just a bunch of people coming together with ideas. You you came into the room to kick it off, or like we're going to do one of these. And that empowered the group to think, this is not just me talking about stuff to talk about stuff. We're looking at what is the best opportunities in the company and how do we focus our energy toward them. And that that kind of gave them the sponsorship. But like then, once it I got out of the idea phase, what did you have to do to to make sure that that was successful? So one, uh, I think people know this, but that event could not be seen as just an IT event. Obviously, you guys came in a great partnership there, but we had to involve the business for this to move anywhere in the customer service space, you know, internally and some of the marketing communications cases we're using right now. Like the business absolutely had to be involved. So before the hackathon, we we went and asked my peers, you know, the presidents of the BUs, to nominate, you know, three or four or five people that they would want to send to this event. And by coming to the event, you knew you were going to be educated, but yet you knew you were going to have an opportunity to create some ideas. And then you were also going to have an opportunity to vote. If you rem remember the event, you walked around with little post-its or colored uh, stickers, if you will, and people got to vote. Remember, we would have whittled it down from 350 use cases to the top 30 and then to the top three. So we actually used the audience to vote on the things that they felt were most important to the business, and those are the ones that we did. So that gave you sort of the price of admission. 
you got your ideation, you got your involvement, and then you got your idea sort of implemented. One of those things like that. I wasn't sure we'll, we'll do another one. And uh, I remember that day the CFO came. Oh my God, when would, when would there be ever be a time a CFO would come to a hackathon? <laughs> the CFO was there, he was like a kid in the candy store. And, uh, you know, folks from engineering and, and marketing and so on and so forth. It was an awesome collaboration with the business. And uh, if you anybody know David Manskin here, besides me, obviously. So he's been a little, um, you know, he's been on the road show a little bit uh, across Generac. Every single business unit head has asked him to come to their team and present Chat GPT. Um, Monday or Tuesday this week, I forget which, he had an all hands with HR. Right here, HR, Kate. <laughs> he had an all HR, the CHRO Generac, asked him to come in and do an hour and a half pitch on Chat GPT HR. Now we didn't have any HR use cases, I don't think, from that uh, from that thing, but I bet they have some. Mm -hmm. They have some now. And so I just think that is awesome. And one, you know, HR is uh, probably some of those risk averse uh, folks. But the fact that the CHO, CHRO asked him to come in and do a, take an hour and a half out of your day, a busy day with HR, with hiring and firing and everything, to learn about chat GPT, something is definitely going to come out of that. There are definitely, I'm sure, a few ideas. And now he's got a new champion in the company. So it's kind of spread like wildfire. Um, but the thing is, if you open up the opportunity for these events, for these conversations, for these art of the possible, you have to do something about it. You just can't do the one piece and not do the follow through on the other piece. You got to talk the talk and then you got to walk the talk. And now I'd like to think, you know, six months into this, this, uh, this journey with open AI, we actually have a huge amount of support in business to kind of come nuts in this space. And we hope it kind of spreads a little bit like, you know, citizen, you know, data scientists or citizen development, where now you don't necessarily have to come to one place to get this thing implemented. You have a private version right there sitting on your desktop. You can actually go nuts with it right then and there. Just share, share and collaborate the stuff that you're doing with other folks. So I, I like where we're at and I like where we're headed. What have you learned pushing the use cases into production? Like if you consider oh, boy. Out or like the customer <laughs> service or like, like what, what was the tipping point where you're like, it's ready to go. Yeah. I'm ready to put this in front of my. Yeah. So I'll just share the three use cases that we've launched. So the, the private instance called power chat that's been live for about it. I piloted it uh, back in um, <coughs> August and we went live in September. So it's, it's had you know, both it and uh, business for at least a month or two playing around with it. Uh, so that was our first launch. Uh, the second launch was this thing we call the uh, window of lost conviction. Does anybody have a generator? In your anybody have a generator? Generate? Awesome. Awesome. So did you buy it after a power outage? No. Come uh, <laughs> <laughs> on. That was quite a good Dear Tim. So one of the use cases that came out of the hackathon was this idea called the window of lost conviction. So when you have a power outage, like the next day or two is when we get our, most of our leads, most of our requests for quotes, you know, most of our phone calls, most of our you know, installation requests. And so the longer that that goes after a power outage, you start to lose that conviction. You start, you start to wean kind of customers off and they kind of get less interested. So we want to capture that opportunity sort of right when that, right when that power outage event uh, happens and sell the generator. And so the window of lost conviction is basically a chat GPT bot that creates uh, anywhere of a number of uh, different types of email templates so that when at that point in time, the day after, two days after, three days after, a week after, two weeks, four weeks later, all the way up until you know, three months later when you haven't done anything, it sends out um, uh, campaign uh, emails based on different types of messages that you know sort of coddle them in the beginning and try to encourage them to buy a generator and then sort of makes fun of them and makes it really annoying <laughs> three or four months down the road. Why haven't you bought when you're stupid? Kind of, uh, kind of so, hey, that drives sales. That improves lead conversion. That's closure rate. I mean, that's a real business value that's been, been launched. So that's the second use case. And the third case is the third use case of the, the work that we did with uh, concurrency. Uh, it's called customer service chat. So basically, we have customer service agents that answer the phones all the time. And if customers call in, we want customers calling so we get their data. So if customers call in and ask a question um, that either has been answered before or the customer service agent doesn't know, it pops up a bot that basically tells them the answer uh, to that question based on three or four years of previously recorded uh, Teams messages of 
customers calling in. And so it's launched on Monday. We've had 62 uh, bot uh, interactions, all positive, all 100% true, and all you know, emoji thumbs up since Tuesday. So it's been live two days. We've had 62 prints. So these are real live use cases, guys. I mean, these are really live things that are in production that are being used. Well, they completely transform the company individually. Probably not. You know, are they going to replace humans in what they do? You know, probably not. It's going to augment you know, work that's already done. But they are they showing the possibilities of this technology and are they exciting people about the technology? They are they improving customer experience, closure and you know, key uh, KPI metrics? Absolutely. So this is contagious and it's going to continue to go on. Can you talk a little bit about any questions from the audience? Oh, yeah, go for the, it. Front uh, row. Lots, but I'll turn to boil it down. Uh, so, what type of impact has this had on your staffing and overall corporate budget? And what sort of QA, <laughs> what sort of QA policies and things um, have you adapted since to quality check yeah. the AI driven products? Yeah, so the budget. That's kind of a you know misnomer, by the way. So nobody has budget for this, guys. In whatever October now, yeah, second half of the year everybody knows IT get budgets get cut. Second half of the year, especially the last quarter of the year, no one in 2023 predicted OpenAI ChatGPT. Nobody put any money in their budget in 2023 with this technology. So as a CIO, you got to figure it out. You got to rob Peter to pay Paul. You got to slice it from one project and give it to another. I think for 2024, the way that we're going to work it is, as an example, we're rolling out Workday. And so basically, if you kind of shave off some of the workday budget in the hopes that you, know, you, know, you create a few chat GPT use cases that go on that workday, it'll kind of fall under a major program. So we'll kind of probably work it, work it that way. But this is all, you know, part time work. There weren't any full time resources set aside for any of this stuff. People are doing this at Generic because they want to learn the tool and they want to see if they can do something really cool with it. This is not anyone's full time job. We have other stuff that we're doing in the world of AI. And so on and so forth. So this thing kind of came out of left field and people just reacted to it. So they wanted to do this from a budget resource perspective. Yes. Um, from a future work perspective, here's where it's going. I mean, who would have seen in a uh, job description for a prompt engineer last year? Have you ever seen one in 2022? There was no such thing as a prompt engineer last year. There is such a thing now. We'll be hiring, you know, hopefully a couple of those. Um, you know, LLM architects, um, you know, come up with your own um, version of, of the job description, but now there are jobs that are possible and opening as a result of this field. And that's exciting because that's that's a game changer. You know, data science took 30 years to come to fruition. I learned about data science when I was in college 30 years ago. This stuff happened less than a year. So there is going to be, if there wasn't a war on talent already, uh, there is definitely going to be a war on talent. If these guys or gals who are sharp uh, in this space, they'll come in anything that they want in any area that they live. So good for them. That answer your question. Yeah, just the other one was like QA, what type of QA? <laughs> There's no automation. So, um, you know, it's not like Salesforce or something like that where you have automated scripts and so on and so forth. This is all manual stuff. And so that use case that I was telling you about the customer service and the chat agent, that's been, you know, my team part time in the weekends kind of <laughs> QA that thing um, with responses, says, <laughs> pulling agents off the phones to see if that answered the question and so on and so forth. So it's very manual right now. There isn't any real automation around this stuff yet. Like there was like there is other you know, enterprise apps. This guy. Um either by by role or by profile, um who in your organization, like inside and outside of IT, has been most um important in driving these first three projects and the projects that are coming. And then uh second question is is do these projects um resemble the types of it projects you've done in the past or are they different in some way like like how do they look different from similar projects in the past is it yeah. is it different technology or yeah. is it different so the guy who leads this for me i he uh, runs my digital incubator and just the, by pure coincidence when i was in this room last year presenting the keynote, he was in this audience working for another company. So I hired him as a result of meeting him at this event <laughs> last year. Yes. He was sitting in the back, remember? He, and he was sitting in the back and he saw my presentation. And I had, and I had an opening for a senior director of uh, 
digital strategy and technology. So he applied for it as a result of meeting me at this uh, at this event last year. I heard him. So there, you have to have a lead. You have to have someone leading it for you. So the person runs. It's probably a um, he has a full time job in terms of running uh, the data and AI, the data AI and BI and team. For me, it's about a twelve person team. But I'd say maybe two or three of those folks are kind of focused on this stuff now. So you have to have a central. You have to have a central incubator. This, this does not work in a normal PMO project team, you know, normal application team. This doesn't work like that. It has to be a, a separate sort of central team that, that drives innovation and incubation. If other people have seen this work other way, I'm, I'm happy to be convinced, but I've not seen it work any other way than, than that. And it's uh, part um, luck. Part strategy that he also runs the data and, and AI and BI team because what do you need for all this stuff? <laughs> you need data. Data. Everybody. Data. You need data. And so um, I, I can find, I can see this happening pretty quick. So if, if any of you guys have ever implemented you know, ML ops, the key to you know, normal AI is you have to keep feeding your AI models data all the time. Data. <laughs> We acquired 15 companies in the last three years. We pull all that data from pushed into these models. So if you're not constantly, you know, reinforcing and training your models, they're going to stay all the time and create insights. I see that happening with this. Well, if you're not constantly updating that team's chat with phone calls that are coming in from customers, you're more likely to give a wrong answer at that bot. So these things need to be kept up to speed and kept that fed. Um, Microsoft to plug here. So we have, we once again sometimes it's better be lucky than good. We just happen to have all of our you know, documents and manuals and processes and all that stuff. We just happen to have them stored in SharePoint. So we hooked all that stuff up to PowerChat and the private instance of chat GPT so you can ask more questions to get more answers from, from a generating perspective. So some of this is luck, <laughs> some of this and since it's a Microsoft kind of sort of conference, I mean it's been it's been as a result of our great partnership with Microsoft. But if you had that stuff stored separately in a different platform, or if you weren't recording your your customer phone calls and teams, and you were you know not doing something else, this stuff would be very difficult to pull together. We just happen to have all this stuff stored in some way, shape, or form in Microsoft technology. Is that um, and then your second question was around the. I guess how does this resemble projects from the past, or what's different? You've answered some of that with. Um, some of the folks you know, yeah. the, the new organization. But. So, you know, the, the joke in IT is that give me a million dollars and you'll see a launch of something in the year. <laughs> you know, Salesforce, Workday, SAP, you know, take your pick of big enterprise app. This is not that. Um, so, Nate and team were out at Generac once again in April, uh, helping us ID with these wonderful use cases. We're live to three um, projects now. So, in less than four months, we've launched three. You know, chat GPT like use cases. That's quick. That is very quick. This stuff has to go because I think, you know, I think the business would lose interest if it sort of weans out a little bit longer than it has. But four months is a nice kind of quick turnaround and it kind of keeps the business partners engaged. If it was anything less than that, they probably probably wouldn't believe it's true. If it's if it anything longer than that, something else will come up. As a higher priority, so if you keep it around that three or four month time, which is which is a stress, you know, on the team, because if you have ten or twelve of these people all at once, they're taking three or four months of these. That's a lot of IT people working on this stuff. So that model has to be figured out somehow, um, and then I can see it maybe a year from now being less centralized, and more decentralized. Right now, to sort of charge it and, and streamline it, scale it uh, fast, it has to it's, it's within that one that one team within that three or four months. Answer your question. Cool. Thank you. Anything else? That's good. Uh, you talked about in the beginning with the policy. Do you have a DLP in place to uh, monitor <laughs> or so? Because you're thinking of your size of an organization yeah. uh, to you know discourage or prevent somebody from putting sensitive information or uh, hitting well, PII stuff in chat. Yeah, so we have a DLP um, and we monitor the heck out of that stuff and people have been caught um, and we asked them why they did it and they, they didn't know. Some people don't read policies. Some people don't <laughs> look at the corporate internet. I, mean, I don't know what the percentage of all cybersecurity policies that get, get read, but I'm sure it's very low. Um, but you're going to have that fallout. And I would say 
probably from the time this thing was launched, you know, around Christmas until the time we actually issued the policy in February or March. Who knows what happened? Who knows what was put out there? But since March, since the, the policy was documented until now, we have a, a much tighter control over it. So the way that we do it is we don't block somebody uh, from going to open AI. We route them to our private instance that they haven't hit them. Um, yeah. So Power Chat is um, you know, the domain is, is marketed across the company, chat.general.com. But if you have to go out to open AI, it redirects you to, to an interface. Are you able to share what DLP service you use? Uh, I mean, it's common technology. There's no secret in any of stuff. <laughs> She's a cybersecurity expert. <laughs> Question back? Yeah, um, I was just going to ask, do you think that we're at a point where more CIOs need convincing? Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're we at the point where CIOs need support convincing their CEO of the importance. Well, and once again, Better to be lucky than good. I happen to report to the CEO at Generac, and without that, this, none of this would really even happen. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things that uh, that uh, are important. So one, not every CIO reports to the CEO. It's unfortunate that that's the case. They probably have my network. CIO networks report to the COO or the CFO. I even know a guy who reports to legal, and that sucks. <laughs> um, so you have to report to the CEO. For any of this stuff, it could be possible. You can't drive transformation two layer, two or three layers below the CEO. So that's number one. Second thing is, um, so I, I remember myself. Um, I was at my daughter's volleyball tournament, first or second week of January, and I followed Benny on, on Twitter, and he posted on Twitter that he wants everyone on the senior executive team to download Chat GPT and play with it. And I sent that to my boss, and he sent out an email, to, like that weekend, to his senior leadership team, telling them the same thing. Not every CEO would do that. Uh, now, would he have done that if I didn't you know, show him the Benny, Benny off tweet? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe a few months later, but he did it right then and there. So I knew that, that I knew that I had this support in me. Would I would I have had that before? I probably still would have done some of the stuff that uh, you know we did, but I would have had it eventually. You know, ask him. But that instance by that email that gave. A open playbook to go with us with this stuff. I can tell you one thing: a lot of CEOs would not send out that email. I was fortunate. How about one more question before we get back to the. What would you you're familiar? Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, what would your recommendation be for uh, smaller organizations that don't necessarily have really large IT organizations? It's uh, maybe a, a team of five or ten IT individuals. They really um, have started seeing requests from the business. Uh, like you, I work in an organization where uh, I do uh, report to the CEO. It's great. It's uh, the company is really wide, uh, are really um, accepting of this new technology. They want to do more. We're just trying to figure out what's the next step. Do we yeah. do something like a, a power chat? Um, or you know, there's some great simple examples that, that you gave. Um, earlier on, uh, any advice for, for small? Well, I was down, uh, Nancy and I were in Chicago on Tuesday speaking at Databricks conference, and that, that same exact question was asked. We probably had about 100, 125 folks uh, in, in the audience that uh, were basically asking us, how do you get started with this stuff? How do you, I mean, I couldn't believe that that, uh, you know, that many people hadn't, hadn't gotten started. So one, you need a champion. And does that champion need to sit 19? No. But they need to be fairly technical, fairly knowledgeable about this technology. They need, they need to have that played with it. They need to have tried it out. You know, they need to know what other folks are doing. But you need a champion. This goes nowhere without a champion and a person driving this. That's number one. Number two, you're ultimately going to have to educate them. This person's ultimately going to have to educate the company in some way, shape, or form. Whether they use a partner like the currency, intent, you know, not not. <laughs> or whether you you know publish a bunch of YouTubes or something and, and send them out to people an email and watch over it, but you're gonna have to educate people. It's changed so fast. Look at this thing that got launched this week. I mean, where the heck did that thing come from? So you need somebody needs to be a champion. Somebody needs to be on top of this. Somebody needs to educate the people. And then, like I said, you're you're gonna need like a central point or a central team that's responsible for incubating it. And that team needs to know that they're not only responsible for incubating it, but they're also responsible for sharing the learnings. If you don't tell people what you're doing, if you don't tell people what you've learned, then someone else is going to try that same thing and they're probably going to fail. 
by a similar issue that you may have had. So that's that's an excellent place to start. I don't think there was a lot of YouTube videos when this first thing, this thing first came out, but now there's a ton of stuff up there. And then you know they can call on you here and uh, <laughs> come out and do a lunch and learn. I'm sure. Carol. So you talked a lot about um, using AI for customer facing and different business cases. What about larger projects, whether it be construction, IT, and using it for planning, estimating, forecasting risk? Do you see it coming that way too? I totally, I mean, this, in the supply chain space, I totally see a ton of use cases mm -hmm. on supply chain. Think about demand and supply planning with all these supply chain challenges still with chips and lead times and so on. So there, there is a whole area of that uh, use cases that are that are out there. So if you, think, if you think that the back end, so there's a ton of space in the supply chain area, I think that's possible. And then you kind of go all the way up in the front end. Um, I do believe that this will become a, the, the company, you know, the team, the org, who figures out the customer facing aspect of this in an enterprise scenario. So we're a, we're a B2B shop, we, you know, 95% of our revenues through a dealer and distributor network where we're not really B2C. But if we can figure out a way that this somehow can augment our marketing information, our materials, our infomercials, you know, all that stuff, our branding to our dealers, holy cow, that is a ton of spend. We spent a ton of money on that stuff. And we can figure out some way this can get external facing and draw our dealers to either our site or the call center to learn this on their own rather than pay all this money for that and educate products. I think that is is also a huge area of opportunity. So on the back end, on the front end, I think it's the biggest, uh, biggest value. And then there's a whole bunch of use cases in the middle that I think will will only get solved if people who are aware and live those problems bring those forward. Some some people don't. Some people are worried that this is job security, and they will that they will bring a a use case that could potentially you know automate an approval cycle for pricing and quotes and so on. So forth. I can see stuff like that as well. So. Those are those are truly can be truly transformational. And then, you know, I why do you think all these technology platforms are coming out with their own chat GPT? I was at Salesforce's conference a few weeks ago. Yeah, Einstein GPT, and they got all this GPT. SAP's come up with theirs, UiPath has theirs. Like all these guys are trying to figure out because they don't want another tool, a GPT tool, brought into yep. and take over their space. Like every week, there's a new announcement of some GPT, Workday GPT, or and I think I think there is an opportunity this to maybe not replace some enterprise software platforms or packages, but certainly delay the decision to buy some of those uh, as a result of waiting to see uh, you know what insights can be driven from. So I can definitely see that happen. Don't tell Microsoft I said that. <laughs> yes. Have you seen much of an effect on intellectual property? And I don't mean protecting what you've done, but the creation of new intellectual property, for example, in the generator. Um, or is anyone doing that? So um, yeah. I'll, I'll give you an interesting use case. I saw this at the, at the Salesforce conference, and, and there's you know huge DEI application. So retailers are using this obviously to um, you know, promote um, clothes and and uh, colors and different types of styles and so on and so forth. And so the content that they're presenting, you know, obviously is a human <clears throat> try on an extra large long 46 long jacket, you know, online and see that uh, in different styles and so on and so forth. So retail is a ton of use cases of this. But if you think about that image, that picture, you can get into issues around DEI <laughs> pretty quick. Who's that person? You know, are they black? Are they white? Or is it women? Is it female? Is it a man? Is it transgender? All this stuff. And so, yes, retail is going nuts with this space, but there's that, that DEI component. You, know, you, you don't want to end up like a Bud Light. <laughs> and uh, so there's a lot of risk uh, in that, but I've seen retail uh, adopt that pretty. What pretty about much. in a generator itself? Have you had sure. experience that you see we can do this with voltage or fewer parts? Do you have engineers who are looking at it to do something to the product itself? Uh, I haven't seen those use cases myself. It doesn't mean they're not happening, but I think any product team at this point, if if I know for a fact our software engineers are using this to break. So we have uh, monitoring and analytics on our power chat 
absolutely one of the most popular use cases is helping write code. So if you assume that that code is part of what you're talking about, then yes. Uh, we, had an in <laughs> we had an intern start this summer, it's the funniest thing. Um, I think he's from UWM and uh, uh, he's in the engineering team. And his first day at work, he was walking around. He posted on LinkedIn. He goes, I'm walking around Generac today and everyone's using chat GPT for writing code. <laughs> he posted that on LinkedIn. So we brought him in, we brought him into the team. He helped uh, develop one of these use cases. So uh, people are doing it. <laughs> this intern is smart enough to blurt that out, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not a huge software development organization. We have, we have some, but we're not Microsoft. If Generac software developers in Waukesha, Wisconsin are using ChatGP to write code, it's happening. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, are you worried about um, like license usage of uh, what ChatGPT would produce and the information it collects from its models and stuff? Yeah, like, that's publicly accessible, but is licensed by an organization or a person, and then being and then using that in production and not being aware. Yeah, of absolutely. The, so that's not free. And you asked about budget here. Yeah, you know, it's not free. I, if I remember correctly, they could. Validate so in Power Chats or internal chat GPT instance, I think uh, it doesn't cost anything to submit, but when you receive content back, it's like 0.001% of a penny per uh, like section of, of data or so per section of, of content. So that's pretty cheap. But you also, like I said, you have to know people. You need people who know what they're doing because if you did not have a rule that manages the size of response from this thing, like this thing can go on forever. It's 0 0.001 pennies kind of pretty quickly. So we we yeah, we have a couple of rules that sort of uh, right size the response as a result of that cost. Um, think about job descriptions. You know, think about uh, things of that nature where it's pulling back a ton of content that's readily available on the internet. That should be Quick. So you need to have you need to have people who are aware of these these rules and, and these things so that doesn't. But I mean, compared to compared to blob storage and Microsoft Azure, this is cheap. Any <laughs> <laughs> uh, other questions? All right, it's been fun, folks. Anything else, Nate? No, just thank you. you thank you for being here. Maybe I'll be back here next year. Yeah, <laughs> you're three days in a row.